Hi there, my name is Sean Dillman. In this video, I'm going to be discussing my recent experience with a pneumothorax, which is also called a collapsed lung. Um, I actually was only discharged from the hospital yesterday, so I'm making this video now so that I can provide the best information I can and so that I have the best recollections uh, as possible. So when this first occurred to me uh, a number of months ago, I went online to look up resources about what was going on. And although I found a lot of good medical websites, I didn't really find any information from other people who had suffered through something like this. So I wanted to make this video as a way to provide information from, from one person who's dealt with something like this to, to someone else that may be dealing with something, something like this uh, and provide whatever information I can. This channel is typically about technology reviews and walkthroughs and reviews of movies and books, but at the end of the day, I just really wanna help other people. And if this video can be helpful, then that's great. The target audience of this video is basically anyone who is suffering a pneumothorax or a collapsed lung, or anyone who has a friend or family member or loved one who may be suffering through that. So for me, this was completely new. Um, the first time it happened to me was about four months ago, and. I had never heard of something like this before in my entire life, so it came as quite of a, a shock to me to, to have to deal with this. Before I get started, please keep in mind that I am not a doctor, I am not medically trained. If you want to find information about the science and the medicine of a collapsed lung, there's all kinds of websites, there's all kinds of videos, um, there's all kinds of stuff like that. This video is actually more about uh, walking you through the experience of someone who suffered something like this um, so that if you're dealing with something like this, you may be able to know the signs or you may be able to know what to expect through this process. So that's more what this video is about. Okay, so the first thing that I'll explain is that uh, a pneumothorax apparently means a collapsed lung and the type that I have, which was called a spontaneous pneumothorax, is not caused by any known cause. Um, it's something that I was told just happens to certain people in a cer certain demographic. Uh, that demographic, I was told, is somewhat young males who are uh, perhaps tall and perhaps thin, and that's about it. Um, there were a few people who suggested to me that being Caucasian may contribute to it occurring, but I'm not sure about that. Um, throughout this process, I suppose I've talked to about eight different doctors at different times, and I just got little bits of information from each, and as I recall, sometimes it was mentioned, but sometimes it was not. So I'm not sure if that's part of it. As far as I know, there's other types of pneumothorax that are caused by traumatic events. Strangely enough, uh, at one point in the hospital, I was sharing a room with a person who also had a pneumothorax, but his was caused by trauma uh, because he fell 10 feet out of a tree. There's different ways that a pneumothorax can occur, a motor vehicle collision, sports injury, things like that. But there's also this type that I had, this, this spontaneous variety, which just seems to happen for no reason. And at one point, um, a doctor actually drew a, a diagram for me. He basically drew a set of lungs and he just drew little round circles kind of near the top of the lobe. And he said that basically what happens is you start to get little holes or, or something like that. And they need to go in and basically take those out um, if a person is having this happen repeatedly, as is what happened with me. I first suffered a pneumothorax in October and then it happened about four months later. So I was told that if it happens once, the chance of it reoccurring is about 25%. If it happens again, the chance of it reoccurring is about 50%. So given those numbers, that's when surgery seems to be the better option to, to let the surgeons go in and um, do some work in the lung and, and try to stop this from, from reoccurring. So my story is that in late October, I was having a coffee with a colleague. We were outside, we were physically distancing. And after we said goodbye to one another, I felt a very sharp pain in my chest um, on my right hand side. And this was a very unusual feeling for me. I'm, I'm generally otherwise a pretty healthy guy. I, I may have a beer, a glass of wine a week. Uh, I don't do drugs, I don't smoke. I try to be fit and, and stay active. So this was a very uh, strange feeling for me. So my mother is a retired nurse, so I, I phoned her and she said, well, where is the pain? And I said, it's on the front, but it's also on the back. And uh, I had a briefcase with me that was about maybe 10 pounds and carrying my briefcase was all of a sudden a really difficult thing to do. 
Um, you know, later I would find out it's because I, I had a collapsed lung and I didn't have as much oxygen as I was accustomed to. But at the time, I, I didn't know what was going on. So I spoke with my mother. She suggested that I go and get a couple of baby, baby aspirin, um, just in case I was having a heart attack, and get over to the hospital. So I, I went to the hospital, I went to the emergency room, uh, and I essentially explained to them that I was having chest pains for, for no known reason. And based on that, they, they got me in pretty quick. They did blood work, they did an EKG, um, they did an ultrasound on my chest, which didn't reveal anything. And then finally, when they did a, uh, an x-ray of my chest, it became very clear for them. Um, the, the doctor came and saw me and he said, we know exactly what's happened, you have a pneumothorax. And I didn't know what that was. I said, what is that? And he said, it means it has a collapsed lung and he told me about it. Um, so basically what happened after that is uh, I met with another doctor who um, installed this, this chest tube into me. So not this side, but this side. So uh, he essentially did a procedure in the emergency room where he froze my chest and uh, got this, this tube into my lung so that the lung could reinflate um, and be kind of equalized with the, the atmosphere uh, outside of my body, I suppose. So this side was kind of hanging down, uh, you know, it was all taped on, and this part was inside uh, of my lung, uh, kind of inserted between um, a few of my ribs and into the lung. So I can tell you that it was very painful to have it installed, and it was very painful to wear it for two days uh, in my body. So the reason that I, I had it in for two days, they, they advised me that they generally like to keep them in for two days to make sure the lung is not going to re-collapse because obviously that would be a real problem. So I, I had that in for, yeah, for two days in October and then finally when I got it out I was so relieved, um, I felt great. And then it took a few weeks for me to go for walks and try to get my, my lungs back up and get the feeling back up but eventually I felt fully recovered and everything felt great. So about four months later um, out of the blue, one evening, I start to feel pain on my front and pain on the back of my, uh, on my back. And I thought, oh my goodness, it, it's probably happening again. So I left it for that evening. The next day, I called a clinic. Uh, they told me that I should probably come in, um, but I, I wanted to, to give it a bit more time and just, just see if, it's, if I was certain. Um, I actually ended up putting up a, a TV on a wall that night and I realized that the task was very difficult and that was probably a good sign that I was not operating, operating with a full uh, set of lungs. And then the next morning, um, the first time I tried to talk in the day, it caused me to gasp and, and wheeze. And, and I kind of realized from that that it was, um, it was probably something that I needed to get checked out. So the last time I was in the emergency room, they told me that if it happened again, that I should go straight back to the emergency room. So that's what I did. Um, I was actually walking to the hospital and I realized that I couldn't make it so I went to see a friend of mine uh, and uh, he drove me to the hospital. So when I arrived at the hospital this time, I told them that I had suffered a pneumothorax in October and they got me in very quickly and they just did another chest x-ray immediately. Um, and they, they actually did it so quickly that the results got back to the administrative staff before I did, before I returned from the x-ray department, and I heard them saying, we've got a pneumo, we've got a pneumo. And I was thinking, oh no, I hope they're not talking about me, but yes, they were. Um, so I met with another doctor. The doctor said, you've, you've had another pneumothorax. Um, he um, met with me and an anesthesiologist, I believe, and, and a nurse. Uh, and they, they gave me some intravenous uh, drugs to, to kind of put me out of it a little bit. I was still, still awake, but uh, un under heavy medication. And they installed another um, chest tube to, to, to cause the lung to reinflate. Um, it was very similar to this one. It was not the exact same model, but anyway, that's kind of not important. I met with a surgeon and he explained to me that the best course of action would be for me to undergo what's called a VATS, a video assisted thoracoscopic surgery. So I believe the way it worked is they cut a few small holes in me um, during the procedure so that they could insert a camera and then in other holes they were able to insert tools. My understanding afterwards is that they had cut out some pizza shaped sliced um, um, areas in my lung which I suppose were the affected areas and that they also did something essentially to irritate the inner cavity uh, of my, my wall 
and do some kind of a procedure to actually glue my lung to the inside of the wall so that it would not separate anymore uh, and that the lung would stay inflated and would, would no longer collapse. So the doctor said that he, he afterwards, he said that he, he believed that it had went quite well and he told me that it had something like a 95% success rate, which means um, essentially a 95% chance that it will not reoccur. So I'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed about that. And as far as I know, the only long-term side effect is that I can no longer go scuba diving. I didn't really plan to go scuba diving, so I guess that's not a big deal. As far as the procedure goes, I, I don't know much about it because they put me under some pretty heavy medication and I was completely out. Um, I should note that my voice is still scratchy because the, uh, the person who, who put me under told me that they would be using a, an air tube to make sure that I was getting oxygen throughout the procedure and then that can inflame the throat because I suppose essentially they were putting a tube down my throat while I was unconscious and they were working on me. So if that's, that's the reason I'm talking this way. I also was discharged only yesterday and I, I still have all of my bandages on and uh, still I'm healing from from the procedure, so I'm not feeling my best. I probably should mention as well that I am very fortunate to be in Canada and this procedure and all of this didn't cost me anything. It's part of our healthcare system here, so I'm extremely thankful for that. That's kind of kind of a relevant thing for me to mention because perhaps the, the procedure and perhaps the steps might be different for you depending on where you are. Something else I'd like to discuss is kind of just the pain management involved with something like this. So the pain of having a pneumothorax is, in my view, you know, if zero is no pain and 10 is the maximum pain, I would say it's somewhere around a three or a four for me. It's, it's uncomfortable, it's a bit of a tight squeezing, but it's, it's bearable. Um, having a chest tube installed is different. Having it installed, you know, with the, the first way that I had it installed where I was not as heavily medicated, I would say that that was maybe a seven or an eight. Uh, it was very, maybe a nine. Like I felt like I just about uh, was going to throw up because of the pain when it was installed. And then wearing it for the days later, I would say it was maybe just at like a constant six or seven, M maybe seven actually, not six, um, because it was just extremely painful. Um, felt very sore, sharp pain, could feel it all the time. Um, it's, not, it's not a fun thing to have to wear for two days. So if you have to do that, um, it brings me no joy to tell you this, but it's painful. So that's something to watch out for. Um, and ideally you can use medication to deal with that. I, I had some various types of medication. I didn't find them to be that effective. Um, so I just kind of gritted my teeth and, and bared it as much as I could. The second time that I had the tube installed, I was given intravenous uh, medications or, or drugs and that put everything out of my mind. I was completely you know, on another level and I didn't feel any pain at the moment. Of course, once the drugs wore off and, and everything, then yes, it was quite a painful thing later. Um, essentially the same as it was back in October of having this, this tube in for day after day. And to give you an idea of the timing actually, so I went into the emergency room this last time. I went in on a Saturday morning. Um, I ended up getting into a, a, a hospital room that evening. And then the next day um, I was slated to, to get the, the operation. That didn't happen. And then I was luckily able to get it um, the following day, Tuesday, um, sometime in the night. I think it was about eight o'clock or nine o'clock. Um, it's about a 30 to an hour long procedure, although with the clocks and everything, I, I don't really quite remember how long it took, you know, when did it start, when did it end. Oh, and something I should mention is that um, I really have a very wonderful girlfriend who helped me through this. She visited me every day. Um, she helped me move things around. She helped, you know, put my sleep mask on or bring me a, a blanket or do this or do that and she was just so wonderful. I, I'm extremely appreciative of her. Um, so if you have someone who can help you, if you're going through something like this, that would really be great. Um, if you don't have anybody, then that's, that's unfortunate, but um, it is manageable, but as with so many things, having another person is, just makes it a lot better. And my neighbor, I should mention, he also visited me a few times and helped keep my spirits up, so I appreciated that. Okay, so after I had the procedure on a Tuesday evening, um, it was uh, very difficult to sleep that night um, and then Wednesday was quite a painful day because the chest tube that they had now installed was even larger 
because it was being used to, to suck uh, blood away from the site inside of the lung. So the idea is that, I believe, is that you don't want too much blood to be there because that'll interfere with the ability of everything to heal up in there. So that was painful because the chest tube was even larger and then I also had the pain of dealing with you know, the incisions and, and everything that goes with, with going through a surgery as, as well as my throat, as I mentioned. So that was quite painful. There was uh, quite a few different medications that were given to me, I believe Tylenol and Dilaudin, I believe was another one. Those were quite effective, I found. Um, I took a sleeping pill one night, that was useful. And yeah, then I was released from the hospital. My uh, output of blood from the surgery site was being recorded in a little device that I had to walk around with. Once it showed that I was basically not putting out very much blood anymore, the doctor said, okay, you know, you're probably fine to have the chest tube out. Once the chest tube was out, then I was able to go and have another chest x-ray. And then once I did another chest x-ray, then uh, it confirmed that uh, everything in the lung looked good, it was not collapsed, and um, I was free to go home. So that was, that was pretty exciting, and I felt good, but uh, that was yesterday, and today I, I don't feel so good. I feel still quite a bit of pain around the surgery sites. It was very difficult to sleep last night. I, I probably only slept a few hours. I did nap again today, which was nice. Okay, so the last thing that I'll mention is that I was given this document, um, which explains about the aftercare that I will be expected to go through. If you'd like to see a copy of this document, please see the description section below. But essentially what it says is that um, my diet is now back to a regular diet. Um, I did have to fast um, quite a number of times for the, the times when they thought they were gonna bring me in for surgery. So I had only a liquid diet um, and then the surgery didn't happen and then I was able to eat and then I was back on a liquid diet and eventually the surgery happened. Um, so after the surgery, I was completely back to a, a normal diet. Um, activity, basically for the next four weeks, I should not be lifting anything over 10 pounds. Uh, I can definitely feel that 10 pounds is a bit much right now. So um, that's uh, that makes perfect sense. Hygiene, um, I do have quite a bit of bandages on and the idea is for me to make sure to not get them wet. Um, so, you know, I can wash my face and I can wash my body, but just make sure to not get that area uh, wet. Wound care, so essentially um, I can apply new dressing if I need. So far it seems fine. And I can remove this after three days and then um, at that point it should, should be fine. As far as the medications that it says that I could be taking, essentially I could be using Tylenol if I wanted, but um, I haven't taken any yet. I, I am in some pain, but I am just looking forward to time passing and, and feeling better as the days go on. Uh, I will be having a follow-up appointment with my surgeon in about four weeks. Um, his office is going to call me and it'll just be over the telephone. I'm not sure what he's going to ask or what that's going to be about, but probably just wants to make sure that I feel okay and that, that everything went fine with the healing process. So yeah, so uh, that's it. I, I should probably go and rest now. I, I think I'm going to do that. So thank you for watching this. As I mentioned at the beginning, this video is something that I, I hope will be useful for people who also have to go through something like this. Um, as I said, I, I made it basically the day after I got out of the hospital so that everything was fresh in my mind and I could remember everything. But if there's anything that I didn't cover here that a person may want to ask about, please just um, write it in the comment section below or get in touch with me. Um, yeah, it's it, it wasn't the funnest thing to have to go through. Um, I'm very fortunate to, to live in a country with a great healthcare system. Um, all of the people who helped me were wonderful, the, the nurses, the doctors, the admin staff, the, the porters, the cooks, all of the people involved. So thank you very much to, to all of them uh, and to my girlfriend and to my neighbor and, and to the people in my life who helped me through this. Typically this channel is about uh, technology reviews and walkthroughs and reviews about books and movies. So. If you're interested in anything like that, please uh, subscribe to my channel. So the final thing I'll say is that if you're going through a pneumothorax, I want to wish you all the best and a speedy recovery. Thanks again. As always, my name is Sean Doman.